So I'm Noel Fitzpatrick, I'm the principal of Fitzpatrick Referrals in Surrey, which is an orthopaedic and neurology referral service for dogs and cats. We see cases that are challenging for people to deal with and uh, whilst I suppose 80 to 90 percent of the stuff that we do is routine, 10 to 20 percent of it is out of the ordinary. So a lot of the stuff that we would do would be routine orthopedics and neurology. So that would be like uh, a disc that has suddenly exploded in the back of a dachshund, for example. Uh, I saw four of those over the last bank holiday weekend. Or a cruciate rupture in a dog, or an elbow problem in a Labrador puppy, which is very, very common. So most of what we do would be routine. And then we do some of the out of the ordinary stuff where perhaps we're the only people that do that kind of stuff. So that would include uh, limb cancer patients that uh, need endoprostheses. That's a big chunk of metal put inside the arm to replace the cancer. Sometimes we have amputees that need to lose a leg, but they won't walk very well on three legs. So we give them an amputation prosthesis so that they can walk with a new implant Yesterday uh, we had a dog that was paralysed and we put a new disc replacement in. Uh, today we've got uh, a new kind of elbow replacement. Uh, tomorrow we've got a new kind of knee replacement. So, you know, I mean, I'm lucky. Every day I come to work, it doesn't seem like work. It's a new challenge and we just respond to biology and create new solutions for those challenges. A lot of people do wonder why we create new implants and new devices and new treatments for conditions that affect dogs and cats. Usually it's born out of frustration, to be honest. Most of the time I just get intensely frustrated that we can't treat a particular condition in an effective way. I mean, ultimately what, what we've got to remember is that my job is to provide pain-free functional quality of life. That's my job. Uh, I'm not motivated by money, so it doesn't affect me what the cost implications in research and development are. It affects the bank, you know, I mean, somebody has to fund it. Uh, but if you're researching and developing a new mechanism to save a dog with cancer, or a new screw to fix a difficult fracture, or a new device to put in place of a disc in a dog's spine, then you could spend £200,000 in research and development and make nothing out of that. But the payoff for doing something like that is enormous because we have tons of problems in dogs and cats that are currently treated suboptimally. So I will always try and think of what would it be in an optimal world? What would be the best solution? Is it effective? Is it safe? is it optimal? Because some of the things we do right now might be safe, but they might not be effective or optimal. A classical example will be cartilage disease in young dogs. So let's say you have a hole inside the joint. It's called OCD. That, now that's not what I'm affected by, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. It's uh, osteochondritis dissecans. Um, osteochondritis dissecans, OCD, is a big problem in young dogs. We see it every week. It affects multiple joints and it causes significant pain and lameness. The conventional treatment for that will be just to scrape out the hole in the hope that new cartilage will grow in. The problem is that if you take any joint, like this joint here, the elbow joint, and it moves like this, you can imagine, if there's a hole inside that bone right there and you've poked the dead cartilage out, how is it going to heal in that environment when it's constantly rubbing? That's like I cut my arm there and I keep rubbing the scab. Well, is that going to heal? I don't think so. So there's a significant body of scientific evidence that would suggest that large defects of cartilage don't heal well if you just do the current standard of care which is to scoop them out. In humans, the standard of care is based on the size and depth of the lesion. Of course it is. So if you've got a big hole 
you probably would do something different than a little hole. And what I try always to do is to think of, well, what's the solution to that problem? So in humans, what they've done is they've taken grafts from the side of your knee and put it in a big hole in a different part of your knee or in a different joint. And now we've got synthetic fillers, so we can fill the hole with a synthetic plug. That's been a massive step forward. I will operate on probably seven cases a day. I consult each day from nine till one and then operate till midnight or two o'clock in the morning, however long it takes. But the reality is that maybe only one of those cases will be something that's advanced over and above the normal. And one of those cases today will be a cartilage transplant. Now at the moment we're still the only center in the world offering synthetic cartilage transplant and we've been doing it for four years with excellent results. It's a process of what do we have now? Is it good enough? If the answer is no, how can we do better? And is that safe and effective? Now, the only way you can do that is to explain to owners of that dog, this is what we have now, is that what you want? You can have that if that's what you want, that's your decision. Or I can give you this other process which we believe is going to be better, and this is the evidence for why we believe it's going to be better. Maybe it's been used in humans already, for example like some of the new total knee replacements we use have already been used in humans. So we would say, okay, well, this works well in humans, or we feel that this would work better because, do you want that? And I believe in honor volitional consent. The Veterinary Surgeons Act in the UK is very specific. You need to act in the interest of that specific patient. So everything you do has to be in the interest of that particular dog or that particular cat. It must be at all times. So my job is to look after that dog that day. It's not good enough not to offer people all the options. And that comes to the third issue. So the concept, the application of concept, and then the ethical and moral implications of the concept, which I'm really, really keen that people understand that you cannot do something just because you can do it. You must do it because it's the right thing to do. So if you think it's in the patient's best interest to be on four legs rather than three, then you invent an amputation prosthesis that works. If you think it's in the patient's best interest not to have a big hole in his joint, then you invent a cartilage filler. If it's in the patient's best interest to have a disc replacement, you invent a disc replacement. But notice what I said, it needs to be in the patient's best interest to provide what I started out with, which is pain-free functional quality of life. I think the veterinary profession needs to embrace change and needs to control that change in an ethical and a morally respectable fashion. I really don't think people care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I've said that a million times. They truly don't. If they don't think that you've got the best interest of the patient at heart, why would they be here? So I expect every patient that comes here to experience the best level of care that's available in the world today. And if it requires us to build kennels that don't have bars so that they can have a nice environment, or if it requires us to find a new surgical solution and develop that with engineers and human doctors and basic physicists and biologists and cellular uh, people and vets, then that's the way it should be. Uh, Fitzpatrick Referrals currently funds internships and residencies across the globe because this is the future. The future of veterinary medicine is to teach the people who are graduating that your clinical skills are the most important skills you'll ever have, number one. Not an MRI scanner, not a CT scanner, but to care clinically about the patient. So that's number one. Number two, to use those tools responsibly and not to use them unnecessarily. If an MRI isn't going to yield a different result by doing it, why do it? It's a waste of money. It's flushing people's money down the toilet. Why would you do that? And the third aspect is to use the technology responsibly. But that will lead to a reconvergence of veterinary medicine and human medicine that diverged 250 years ago. And I firmly believe that if by providing solutions for animals and solutions for humans that are in the interest of that particular species, why would you not share that information with the other species? Of course you would. It's stupid to consider that we can keep going on working in little igloos in the 21st century. I'm doing a video now for the internet. Well, Joe Bloggs 
is going to watch this and go, oh, okay, I see, uh, right, well, maybe that would make me think about this philosophy of One Life, One Medicine. I have a foundation called the One Life, One Medicine Foundation that hopefully in the future will fund bright young individuals to go ahead and do exactly that, reconvert human and animal medicine. I fervently believe it's the only way forward. And um, when I, to come to the end of this rambling answer to your question, when I consider that how many things are suboptimal, how many things that we do that don't have good results, I think, well, well if that is down to us, not having an advanced enough implant, why are we allowing that to happen? We can do almost anything with the technology. It doesn't make it right. It needs to be ethically right. It needs to be morally right. And it needs to be in the interest of that patient. But if it is, then why would you not offer it to the people? And why would you not want to make a difference? I'm motivated by changing things for the better forever for human and animal medicine. And now that people know that you can save a leg that has cancer, you can put on an amputation prosthesis in a 98 kilogram mastiff that isn't going to manage well on three legs. You can do a cartilage transplant, you can do a disc replacement, you can do all of these things now. Why would you not want to consider that? It seems lunacy to me to not want to consider that. Of course you want to consider it, it's your friend. And ultimately that's what it boils down to, the bond between an animal and a human which probably there's no greater example of unconditional love. Probably there isn't. Because I know that the fun I have with my dog or the relationship I have with my dog is very unique. It's not the same relationship as another person would have with their dog or another person would have with another person. But if you think about interpersonal relationships with humans, a lot of it is conditional. Well, I like you because blah, blah, blah. With a dog or a cat, I like you. Oh, whoa, you like me, regardless of whether I'm grumpy regardless of whether I smell. Brilliant! That's what we do as veterinary surgeons. We reinforce that bond of unconditional love by try, trying to advance things in an ethically and morally robust fashion for the betterment of all, all creatures. Mm -hmm.